um, why don't you give us a little tour? Okay, so um, the property that we live on is, um, we live on a farm. So we have about 300 animals at any given time. And so part of my experience here is about being in nature, which coming from New York City was not something that I was particularly used to. And um, the studio that I have is in what we call the mill. And it's where my husband used to have a knitting mill and he used to make socks and um, cart wool and things like that. So it's industrial, but it's also like kind of like a barn. And so behind me, you can see I have this nice wall, which is where I have all my paintings. And I'm usually painting on the floor right there, but I kind of tidied it up for everybody today so that I could have them up on the wall. And then um, there's sort of this miscellaneous area here, which is storage and also where I put my drawings. You can see I have a little drawing rack there. And then if you go down, here's my palette. And this is the table that I work on where you can see, I'm using my computer, so it's not the best. Oh, see my ducks? I have ducks. So I've got some ducks that are, that are little ducklings in that box. And this is the table that I work on. And this is where I make a lot of my works on paper. So I'm gonna drag this over and see, you can see the corner there. That's where I make, there's a really nice light that happens. Not, it's kind of bright right now, but that's, a, a spot that I'm, I like to be by the window. So I work off of that little corner there. And usually I do that when I need a little break from the paintings. It's like a, I can sort of work on that, let those dry, do something else. And then I always come back to the drawings. Um, and usually those are something that just like the paintings I'll work on maybe you know, 40 at the same time, and I'll spread out, put them all together, start all over again, that kind of um, process. So, oh, and then wait, let me unplug for just a second. You can see those windows, I overlook the farm. So right now in that field are all the lambs that we had from this last spring. So that's kind of exciting, especially if we have a bottle baby because the bottle babies end up coming to get to stay with me in the studio, mm -hmm. so I get to take care of them. They become like a personal assistant. So, and then there's just a water heater and that's it. <laughs> but it's really big and... What's, um, the, um, what's that ceiling area? So this Ooh. is a skylight. So you can sort of see there's a skylight and it's got a walkway. And then I have these payankis that I make. So I hang those up there and that is where we have a lot of storage. Um, this is heated though. So it's not like we use this for animals or anything. It's, um, it's got cement floors and it's, I think it's like thermal heated. Mm -hmm. um, is that right? We'll go Water. with that. Yeah, we'll go with that. So it's nice and warm in here. And then I got a fireplace. So we're gonna hook up the fireplace for those really cold nights. When do you usually work? Well, I used to be a night owl, but lately I find I don't have the same kind of energy. And I, the light here is so nice that during the day is when I've been working. So I try to get in, um, I teach on Thursdays, but I try to get in at least six to 10 hours a day. So usually that's from like 8.30 till like five in the morning. I mean, you know, in the evening. Right. And that's doing a variety of different things. So yeah, working it's... on the paintings, working on the drawings, doing some of your administrative type stuff. Yeah. Yeah. My administrative type stuff too. Yeah. That's thrown in there. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I mean, I think some people, you know, if, if they're not an artist, don't realize that there is so much. I mean, especially if you're working with multiple galleries and got different shows coming up there's a lot of administrative work that needs to happen to make it all run smoothly and and that can take hours yeah you know it's not just um 
you make the work, you have to drop it off at the photographer or you have to photograph it yourself or, and then you do that. And then you're taking inventory and then you're um, shipping. So, you know, shipping can be, can take all day to ship a painting out because you've got to pack it and wrap it. And, you know, I do, I do have somebody who helps me sometimes. So, you know, and I used to make all the panels myself and that gets old fast. So, you know, now I have somebody make them for me because it's just too much to try to then keep up with trying to make paintings and wanting to share your ideas. And if you spend three months making the stuff, you know, in order to get ready, it's already a process. And I like that process, I do, because it helps me think about the paintings. You know, as I'm gessoing and doing all that, I, I actually enjoy that part because it helps me, it helps me think about what I wanna do in terms of the next color, the next idea, because I'm a big advocate of not being glued to outcome. So I sort of want the painting to tell me what it needs. And so that process part is really actually pretty helpful. Um, but making the panels is not something I'm interested in doing so much anymore. So I have those made. So do you wanna talk a little bit about your process? I know it's really um, laborious, the gessoing and the sanding and just the layers that you build up. Do you wanna sort of give us a highlight sure. on that? So um, there, you know, uh, there's a, many different ways to make a painting. So, you know, anywhere from painting on cardboard or paper, all the way up to panel, to fresco, to all kinds of things. And the way that has really worked for me is uh, working on wood panel. But what I do is I stretch linen over the wood panel. And the reason I stretch linen over it is because, because not always, sometimes there'll be a canvas one thrown in there. Um, because I happen to have a piece of canvas and, you know, I might use it, but lately I've gotten very interested in only using linen because I want to be consistent, but also I really love the brown edge. You know, I'm like, the, I'm such a, I really, I'm very detail oriented. So having that brown edge makes all the difference for me. I don't have to paint it. I don't have to, it's like very neutral. I, it's not the white part of the canvas. And so I really like that as an edge. You know, sometimes there'll be like a drip that goes over whatever, but I don't mind that so much. And Do you want to show us one? Do you want to uh, show us that difference between a brown linen edge and a canvas? Or are they all taped over? They're all taped over right now. Um, and I don't have a canvas one actually to show okay. you, but like, let's just say one's cream colored and one is just like very neutral linen-y brown. It's very pretty. Um, yeah. And then what I do is I, I used to use a traditional method of hide glue. And so rabbits, they call it rabbit skin glue or hide glue, which is water-based, heat it, it has to heat between 140 and 165 degrees. It's very process oriented and I loved it. But then I started to think about humidity and something that is water-based and mold and things like that. So recently I switched gears and I switched gears to a acrylic uh, gesso. Well, I wouldn't call it a gesso. Um, it's called GAC. There's two different types, GAC 100 and then GAC 400. And GAC 400 goes on first for me and it basically sizes the linen. It helps the linen. You don't have to stretch too tightly so that you're not gonna have a lot of warping. And for me, I like that because um, it makes it very taut. And then I put on, to seal it completely, then I put on GAC 100, and that seals the edges and seals it. But the last, so those are two layers. Then the last four layers are um, uh, a, a, what do you call it? A absorbent ground. And the absorbent ground that I like happens to be for encaustic. And the reason I 
RNF makes it, and I love it because it absorbs color in a totally different way than um, it being absorbent. So it's porous rather than an acrylic gesso, which tends to want to kind of let everything rest on the surface. And so the absorbent ground for me is great because I can sand it and then another layer comes through. It's almost like um, a geographical, it's like something that's really topical. Like you're looking at it and there's all these different layers. And, and it's something that I always strive for because I would look at a painting like, like Giotto and I would see all those beautiful different layers of turquoises and pinks and things like that. And that was so inspiring to me, even though I didn't make paintings like that. And so surface was really a big deal. And so that became a big part of my process. And that absorbent ground really helps to maintain the vibrancy of the color and, and sort of like all these different yummy, delicious layers. Then, not always, but sometimes if there's like a goober in it or a hair, or it's got a funny texture, I'll sand it. But I tend to put the um, gesso on with a, a squeegee. Uh, I have like the squeegee, so it makes it very uh, um, even. And because it's absorbent ground, it dries really quickly. So I let that dry. I might sand it, come back to it. And then at that point, you know, within a, I kind of let it, I want to let it sit for like a week, then I'll come in and maybe do a wash or something like that. Um, but that's, that's generally how I begin the paintings. Um, and I don't have a plan. Everybody always asks me, do you have a plan? Do you know what you're going to paint? And I, I don't know how other artists do that. It doesn't work for me. So my process is all about letting the painting do what it needs to do. And if I don't like what it's doing, I might erase it, you know, sand it down or something like that, but I don't try to control it too much. Um, and, you know, I mean, I've been doing this for a while and I always am very excited when I do something that I didn't know I could do or that was really different or weird. And that's usually the thing that makes me the most uncomfortable, but it's also kind of the most exciting thing at the same time. So that's the part, that's the part of painting that I think is very exciting for me. It's like, it's like getting lost a little bit and you don't know what you're gonna find along the way, like an amazing sugar shack or a great swimming hole or, and for me being fluid like that, no, knowing a little bit about maybe what paint does, but you know, not really knowing what is going to happen or what it's going to look like. You know, you might make the same mark a hundred times and it's the hundred and first time that's the one that's the clinker that's like, yeah, spot on. And you just don't know until you kind of see it. And that seems to work for me, for my process. So your process, um, you've developed this over time. What sort of led to that process? Like, I mean, obviously just, experience and trial and error and that kind of thing but um like when would you say that sort of you fell into this groove that really made sense for you at what point in your career um I would have to say it was definitely I would say within the last 10 years um it was after my son was born because I actually took a break before he was born, uh, trying to have a baby um, because I didn't want to poison him. So I decided, <laughs> I decided to just kind of chill. And I did a lot of works on paper and things like that. Um, and I think that by taking that break, you know, as much as I missed it, oddly, I think it helped me sort of think about what direction I wanted to go in. And I think that what started to happen for me is I really thought that I was a purely only an abstract painter. I think I poo-pooed the idea of landscape or I didn't quite understand what my definition of it was yet, if that makes sense, or that it could, that I didn't have to conform. That's really what I think it was, that I, I didn't have to conform to a traditional way of making landscape. And that actually, that I could make something that was an alternate universe 
that was my own world that I didn't have to, um, that I didn't have to sort of apologize for. Does that make sense? Like yeah. our, our understanding of landscape is, and that's sort of exciting to me, but I think probably um, it, you know, I think it took me a while to get back into it. And probably the last 10 years, I was able to really focus really heavily on what that vision may or may not be. Um, it took me a while, I think, personally. I think it took me a while. I, I always tried to do things that I, like using a paintbrush to me is really foreign. I mean, I think I originally thought that that was the way to work because that's what I was taught or that's what I thought art was, but I actually don't really use a lot of paintbrushes even. I use like me, I like going to the hardware store and finding like squeegees and weird other tools and um, things that are not necessarily, necessarily traditional painting. And that's the kind of mark that is very interesting to me. Mm -hmm. And because of that, I think what starts to happen is I let the material do a lot of work for me. And um, that's where chance comes in. And I think that's really exciting. So creating that room for chance to come in. Oh yeah, possibilities. Yeah. You have to be open to the possibilities because if you're not open and you're trying to control it all the time, you're screwed. I mean, it's just like, it's not gonna turn out great. You know, it's like falling in love. And the, the more and more you try to like get, grasp onto it, the further away it wants to go, right? So you kind of have to surrender to it. And I really feel like painting is that thing. It really mm -hmm. does that. You just have to surrender to it and you have to keep doing it. And you have to sort of know and have faith that something maybe sort of kind of interesting might happen. And, um... Do you have that period of time where you go through the ugly zone? No, I don't. That's because good. I don't I don't take it personally. Oh good. Yeah, I don't take it personally and I know that if I don't like something, I can just make it go away. <laughs> I can just sand it, I can restretch it. It's no big deal. So I learned I know there's a myth about that like struggling, right? Those like creative blocks. And I actually have not had one of those. I think partly because I do so much and I don't, I mean, I do a lot of sitting and looking and waiting. I think 90% of making art is like looking and sort of like waiting for that one little moment where you like can take a risk or do something that's a little off or a little different. Um, but I think I'm doing so many things, like actually working on so many paintings at one time that it doesn't allow for that block because I don't have the patience to like sit there and watch paint dry, literally. Like that's what it, I can't do that. I, I, even with my students, I'm like, you cannot work on one painting at a time because you're going to drive yourself absolutely frigging bonkers. So you know, I, I'm very good at multitasking in that way. And so I end mm -hmm. up getting a lot done because I'm very busy. Like I might work on 40 paintings to get 10 good ones. And then I'll kind of like bring something new in and start again. So I've never, thank God. I mean, I should probably knock on wood that I just have not had that block. And I don't, I don't know. I don't, I don't even know how to tell people to get out of it because I think it's a very personal space. Mm -hmm. Like I don't Absolutely. have advice about that. Just keep so, working. Just keep working. Yeah. And so you were telling me earlier that you work on the floor um, and usually you'll have a bunch of different pieces all over the floor. The pieces that are behind you are all works in progress, right? Yes. So like, and this is a new thing for me too, um, is that I... I wanted to play with space a little bit. So even though I make landscapes, I didn't want to conform to landscape orientation. I was very interested in, and still am, really interested in compressed space and space that's illogical and doesn't make sense. And yet that is atmospheric 
and a little ephemeral. Like I really am interested in that. I'm interested in it when I look at other people's work. I'm interested in it when I look at nature. I'm interested in it when I think of the elements like fire, water, all that. I'm I like, I like that's something that is like a big concern of mine. And so I started, I had a commission a couple, maybe last spring or maybe it was the spring before and it was for a landscape. And it was like a little scary, but also kind of exciting. And I did it and it was like, it was sort of like this, like what was I thinking kind of moment? Like that was dumb. And now I'm very interested in trying to utilize some of the either personal symbolism, you know, formal elements to kind of play with that space and still create the compression I want or am interested in possibly um, and have it be, because, you know, a portrait orientation is, is about compressed space and it, and it pushes in from the sides. And that's why it's called portrait. Whereas landscape orientation is about a particular kind of expanse of space, right? So sort of relearning that and understanding that I can have it maybe both ways, sort of kind of, has been exciting for me. And so the landscape orientation, although it's new, is um, something I've been sort of like milling over for a while and, these that you can kind of see those larger ones in the back are the landscape orientation and and i'm using this break almost like a parentheses to create like a little bit of like a push pull in painting so i'm using like this soft shadowy mirror effect to kind of release that i call it like the fourth dimension you know like you know playing with gravity a little bit and space so that's what that's what that's that's what these paintings are about, and they're big for me. I mean, I, I, I for many years only made like sixteen by twelve inch paintings. Like I was very happy doing that, and part of that I think was living in New York City and carting stuff around. And part of it was like, is it going to fit in my car? And another part of it was like, oh, I can just sit here and have this in my lap. It's very comfortable, right? And I'm still have a hard time with the bigger ones because I can't get, if it's too big, I have to like have somebody come help me move it. And, you know, it's, it's a little tricky, but I'm working around it. Right. So I'm trying to like, say, it's okay. We'll see what this looks like. We'll explore this. And if I have to lift it and pull it and drag it, so be it. Um, the, the, the wash is like this one I keep looking at on your shoulder, the big blue one I mean it has just this over here yeah it's like so uh, I don't know it feels like you've how many layers of that like to get that gradient and then the sort of I don't know what you call the vertical gradients that then kind of come in it just seems so oh. ethereal um airbrushed almost it's like how does how does it. that well Another trick that I started to play with a little bit was taping. And I was like very against it for a really long time. I did everything by hand, everything. And, you know, I might put a piece of paper there to like block something out. But mm -hmm. the idea of taping for some reason, I, I had like a mental block about it. Maybe I thought I was cheating. I don't know you know? And ultimately I tried it and was like, again, you know, like, just try it. You might like it. <laughs> and so I did. And I, I use it as a way to create, um, like a, a, like that parentheses or that wall. And I, I, do a layer and then like that might go in one direction and then I might tape it to create that compression. And I use a lot of layers. I use a lot of liquid because I, I like liquid. It's, a, it's a, I believe it's petroleum based, unfortunately, but it dries quickly. And it also is something that as it's drying, you can really smooth things out. And I have a variety of like soft 
brushes that aren't necessarily for oil paint. They might be for acrylic or something like that. And um, so it's like non-traditional ways of working with oils. And that's how I get that soft. It's like I start dark and I just keep going over it like a hundred times to like and moving it out and moving it out and moving it out until, you know, and then I can step back and I see, is it smooth enough? Is it, does it, cause I, I kind of like, and I always have liked this where a painter can sort of trick us a little bit in that we don't know necessarily how they made it or what they did. And then later you find out how they did it and it still doesn't make sense, right? And I love that, like, that sometimes you don't know when you're, when, when you're looking at my work, how I might've put it together. There's a softness about it. And I th those layers, I think, help to create that atmospheric perspective that's a little more elusive. Um, maybe that, I hope that answers your question. It does answer my question. I mean, I think elusive is a really great term. It feels just like, it's like air currents. They're so thin and just layered on top of each other. Um, I wanted to ask everybody in the call if they have any questions about Gabe's process or anything we've talked about so far. If you do, unmute yourself and shout it out. And if you don't, that's I just okay. wanted to say that recently Gabe posted something for this talk on Instagram that is one of the most beautiful pieces I've seen by her. Do you know which piece I'm talking about, Gabe? Um, is it blue? Like it. No, it's very peachy. Oh, that um, is called, a, I think, is that called Jubilee? Is that Jubilee, Laura? Yes. I think. Yes. Yes. It, it is so beautiful. It made me drool. Oh, oh I love drooling. <laughs> <laughs> but it has yeah. all of those qualities of some elements of landscape and some just of colored soft air. Yeah. Um, some nature references. And then there's also this little bit of hard edge in there. Yeah. It just seems the best combination a lot of a lot of the elements that you use. I well, just think you're getting better and better. Oh, well, thank you. I, you know what, I think that brings up a really interesting idea is that I'm really interested in, in dualities, right? So like contrasting elements, because I think it's really interesting. I've always been attracted to that. Even when I looked at photography or sculpture where you had something that was maybe lacy, you know, and then something that was made out of metal. So, you know, all together, I sort of like those. I mean, if they're done well, sometimes not so much, but like if it's done really well, where the materiality, the actual material, but also the, the pattern of one thing up against like something soft, I think is a really interesting way of, of, uh, um, of not only making work, but when I look at it in other people's work or even in life, like you have something that's like fuzzy up against something that's like super flat is such an interesting dynamic. And so in my paintings, that's what I'm trying to achieve. It's like, those are concerns of mine. It doesn't mean that's what the painting is about. I don't really, because it's gonna be about something else for somebody else. But what I'm really interested in is those dualities because those dualities exist. It's part of like the human condition. It's part of um, how the world operates, love, peace, war, you know, there's like a lot of, of all that stuff. And it, I think it helps me to feel, it helps me to like figure out how I identify with the world. So those, those geometric elements are the contrast, right? That's the contrast. And they become sort of stands, stand-ins for um, like, like, uh, pipes or, um, or water or some other element that's breaking up the space. They become like architecture up against nature. And sort of, I, I really like that dynamic a lot. And that's something I really try. It's not accidental. Like I really look for that in the work and I'm always looking like, I sort of think of it like this is that I have all this information, like whether it's personal symbolism or it's um, just like certain 
uh, motifs or something that keep reoccurring in my brain. And I put them in a well. And whenever I pull up the well, like pull up the bucket, I don't always know where they're going to go. And I just look at it and I say, okay, it's going to go here. Or it's going to go there. And that I feel like that makes the work really formal, right? It's like a very formal approach to painting. And, uh, and it's all about like all the principles of design. And uh, I mean, all the elements of design and the principles of design and all those different textures and line and all that stuff in combination, hopefully will make something successful. But I really like that those dualities that you're pointing out. That's like very exciting for me. I love that. You're such a Libra. <laughs> yeah, there's that too. <laughs> Just as a side note, um, Dopamine Nation. I was listening to NPR and there was like a whole thing about um, how our brain works and is constantly trying to level and that if there isn't the pain, then we don't get the pleasure and how you know, we're constantly seeking one or the other to yeah. find that balance or whatnot. So anyway, I think it'd be a it's, good book. It's not us. an old idea. I mean, Plato, mm -hmm. Plato said, you know, you, in, in order to have good, you need to know what evil is, right? So I think that those dualities have always existed. And um, I mean, I'm sure I just butchered that quote quite a bit, but that's the gist of it, you know? Um just the whole thought that we feel that, we see that in the world, but the chemicals in our brain are doing that too. Mm -hmm. Is It's like your, your fourth dimension, it's continuous and continuous and continuous. Um, I wanna back up a little bit because we've heard a lot about your process or at least sort of your, your mindset and um, how it starts out, but you are the daughter of a painter. Mm -hmm. an artist and I would love to know a little bit about what it was like growing up with an artist as a, a parent and how that may or may not have affected your outlook and taking the art path um well I think it affected it a lot actually I mean I'm very close with my father and my mother too but the, my father was the painter and I don't know, you know, I think of it like this, is that if you don't know anything different, that's all you know. I didn't think it was any different. Like, it wasn't like, oh, I'm different because, you know, somebody else grew up. You just, that's what you're in. So that's what you experience. I think, I think my parents were very good about neither discouraging me or encouraging me right? They just kind of let me figure it out on my own. And we're always proud of what that direction was at any given point. I don't think that they were like, oh, goody, you know, she's going to be, I don't think they were really thrilled, but I also don't think they were horrified either. You know, I think they were like, well, okay, it makes sense, you know, and growing up in New York in the 70s and 80s was really a trip. And I loved it. I thought it was so fun. And, you know, I mean, now it's a little bit different, but I still have nothing bad to say about New York. I loved it. It was amazing. The kinds of people that we knew as were always really interesting. And I think growing up in that environment, I became very, I became like an observer, you know, I, I mean, I was also an only child, so I didn't mind being by myself and stuff, but like we would have, you know, there would be parties at either our house or somewhere else. And it was always really fun. Like the conversations were amazing. And, um, you know, you're around all these really interesting, bright, creative people. And it's very exciting. It was a kind of a certain kind of energy. And I don't know what that would be like now necessarily, but for me, it was um, really, really like amazing, gritty, uh, kind of raw, and also um, very supportive. You know, um, my dad taught me a lot or has, has taught me a lot about thinking, right? About like how to look at 
art and also how to, I mean, he's very process oriented in his own work. So I think that definitely rubbed off on me. And it's funny because now I think uh, now of all the times that we've been making paintings, even though we've never made paintings together, like it's not like we shared a studio or anything like that. I think we are actually like aligned, you know, like in terms of like kind of what we're trying to talk about. And I find that I'm getting like goose pimples because I find that even though he's coming from a very different point of view, um, you know, he's talking about something that's different. We both make landscape paintings. And, um, and I find that now more, even though I, you know, like we don't look at each other's work in that way. Uh, but I think now more than any other time in my life and his life that our sort of our paths are crossing a little bit, which I find very interesting. Do you, do you guys um, have studio visits? I actually don't have studio visits anymore, to be honest. Um, I mean, like, I don't set anything up unless it's, you know, dealer or gallerist or you know something and I might have a friend come in and look at it but it's not it's very casual I don't part of that was a, a, a very specific like I don't really not that I don't care what anybody thinks or says it's not that but I don't really need personally I don't really want that anymore and it's something I don't want that noise to be honest. It's not like I'm seeking affirmation. I'm kind of like, I say to myself, I'm gonna do this and I'm gonna do it my way and I'm gonna see if it works, but I don't, I don't really want direction. Oh, that's not what I'm looking for. I think in the past we had, you know, I'd say, hey, I'm, I'm working on this group of paintings. I really want you to see it. Um, and, but I don't, it's not something I'm, and I know a lot of artists, they love that, I think. And that's wonderful. I just don't know if it's something that I'm particularly interested in right now um, on a personal level. I mean, if I go over there for dinner and I see that there's a bunch of stuff going on in his studio, you betcha I'm going to like walk in and poke around and do stuff. And he'll do the same here, but it's not formal in that way. Okay. Very interesting. And now you have a son in art school. Oh, Yeah. I have a son going to art school. So it's like a third generation now. And that's exciting. You know, I'm excited for him. What and school is Emmett at? He's at Pratt and he's like living his best life Great. in Brooklyn, you know, and he, he started there in fashion and then he's immediately switched gears. Cause I, I mean, he likes, I just think he didn't know what he wanted to do, but, um, cause you're in college. Why would you know what you're going to do? You know, like you shouldn't college is not, that's not what it's about, right? You're just supposed to figure stuff out. And he switched gears uh, to industrial design. And it just makes a lot of sense. Like he, the thing that he liked so much about fashion, I think was like putting stuff together. He really thinks about like how things connect and he's always been, it's like a whole Lego, you know, brain set kind of or something and no now he's doing industrial design and really loves it and he got into this program in Copenhagen for the summer so we're going there for a week before his classes start uh in June so that'll be really fun for us to travel yay yeah I know they really? grow up yeah oh my God. you know it's crazy <laughs> Oh, Gabe, I love your energy. You're so <laughs> thanks. <laughs> I just feel like you're fearless. And um, but the minute that I, I mean, we talked before, right? But when I met you in person at Volta, yeah. when I got to actually like be in your presence, I was just taken by how positive and fearless and ready for whatever the universe is going to bring at you. And um I, just, I wasn't always, I mean, you know, I, I had to do a lot of work. Let's put it that way. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's how you get your battle. Yeah. Ready. That's right. That's right. Um, so, and you're now sort of, um, you're teaching, you said school was wrapping up. Yep. We just finished our last class on Thursday and at Fordham, which is where I teach, um, visual thinking, 
painting and drawing, not all at the same time. I have three different classes that we kind of switch around and um, they have their final, we have a kind of, they call it reading day. We have a week off and they're organizing their portfolios. And then our last project is due May 12th. So I go in one more time for final review, um, but everybody seems to be doing fine. And I also, you know, the whole Zoom thing, if anybody's having issue, I just tell them to like, let's have a Zoom conversation. I'll help you, you know, and that actually has been really good, I think, you know, um, but I, was, I, I wasn't the only one, but one of very few, faculty who taught in person the entire time, except when we were in lockdown. So um, that was hard. That was really hard because it was hard. It was hard because everybody was scared, but it was also good for the students because it, that was like their only class that they had in person. So it was like their way to be around people. And um, I, I don't really know any other way to teach. I'm like very hands-on with stuff. So that interaction and talking to people um, was like, it's tough on Zoom. So I chose to do it in person and I much rather, I enjoyed it that way, but I can do the other stuff too. You know, I can do this. I can Zoom, have Zoom conversations and tell them and look at pictures and talk to them about their ideas and stuff. And then that's it. Uh oh, you're muted. There you are. Nope, go. You're muted. <laughs> so then you're done. And then yeah. what? Well, uh, I'm going to, um, I have a show in September, but then, uh, and I've one in LA. So I'm just painting, trying to get ready for that. Finishing, you know, we finished, um, well, I didn't finish, we finished your show, but I'm still working on these landscapes for you. And, um, Copenhagen and then I go to Spain for a month so I'm going to be busy and so um you want to tell people about that like you, you know you guys bought that place in Spain um in a little village and, and it's so yeah it's romantic like, and amazing it's awesome yeah I can't it's we go there and we spend time and it's our way to sort of be away I don't really do a lot of work there because it's not set up that way but we do some traveling my folks are going to come out this summer and spend the month with us so that'll be really great um I yeah it's I think it's actually influenced my work a little bit, which is no big surprise, right? Because the area that um, that we live in is very, it's surrounded by water. So water is a big issue in my work. So I think about that a lot. And, um, you know, I think, I think this happens with all of us as you travel somewhere and or you experience something, it doesn't even need to be traveling, or you try a new food, whatever it is. And you can't, you know, you don't know what you do or say today, how it's going to affect tomorrow. So it takes time sometimes, right, for all that stuff to sink in, and for you to actually think about how it's affecting you, and if you, if you even care. And so I think that an experience like that has actually slowly over time affected how I think how I'm working and, you know, how can it not? It's like anything, you know, life, anything, trauma, anything is going to affect your work in one way or another, you know? Um, can you, so I know that that was something that kind of like looked at finding and you say you don't work there when you're there right not even on watercolors or watercolors i do i do work on watercolors there um mm -hmm. the idea of carrying wood panels mm -hmm. is like so not exciting to me so i think that's just the lazy part of me you know mm -hmm. but i think um the, the funny little town that we have i actually met the well, we're, you know, friends with a lot of the, it's such a small town. Everybody knows us as the Americanos, but um, they have like a community gallery there. That's like part of their historical. And so they asked me if I wanted to do a show there and I was like, yeah, sure. And I was like, oh God, I'm going to have to like, you know, 
figure out a way to like, I mean, you, you know, it's easy enough to ship it, I suppose, but you know, figuring out a way to like load all this stuff into my suitcase is, you know, <laughs> going to be a, it's going to be a challenge. <laughs> I just love the idea of you going over there and, um, the thing that we talked about when you said, oh, well, you know, when you try to find a little place over there, I said, how do you furnish it? You know, what, what is that like? And you're like, oh, "Oh, well, whoever died in it just leaves everything in there. Yeah. It's really weird. And I don't, I don't know if this is very specific to Spain necessarily, because I didn't look anywhere else, but it, every time we went to look at something and I'm not kidding every place, it was like the ghost of the person who had previously owned it was there from the slippers on the bed to the lozenges, like cough lozenges, you know, or like a candle that was already burnt down to nothing or the paintings in the, in the house or like dishes, everything (laughs) like, potato peelers, like the craziest stuff. It was all there. And it was like we, um, but, but nobody lived there. It, I think it's like a cultural thing. They just are like, no, okay. You know, moving on. I don't think they, uh, I think that it's not necessarily something that in the Spanish culture, they're very interested in new things. And so antiques or things like that. And I know I'm generalizing here a little bit, but that's the impression I get from going there that that's not something that they are interested in. I mean, we went and we looked at this one place and the guy who was showing it was like the nephew or grandson of the owner and all his baby pictures were like all over the place. And I'm like, who is that guy? And he's like, oh, it's me. You know, it's like, it's like crazy. It was just nuts. It was very, very spooky and kind of creepy good at the same time. It was really uh-huh. enlightening. Like here you in the States, they clean it out, right? They, they, they clean it out or they make it look really fantastic with like new sofa or something, right? To like right. highlight. And it was just like very strange, really weird. I just feel like you're so... Um... Like you absorb things and I just imagine you absorbing these histories and experiences of these people or whatnot. Anyway, I don't know. Yeah. I, I'm, I just want to be in your pocket when you're there. Oh, well, you have to come visit us. <laughs> yeah. And those truffle potato chips that uh, I had that you said were from Spain that I was like, oh, oh yeah. About. Yeah. Those are um, really tasty. <laughs> Does, does anyone have any questions at all for Miss Gabe? Everybody's just happy to see your beautiful face and your <laughs> fuzzy balls. Um, My only question is, is that um, I would like you next time you come into the city to visit Emmett to give us a call. Oh, sure. I sure would. I yeah. pass by your house all the time. Ring the bell. Okay. Um, I will totally do that, Pam. I'll ring the bell. Come visit. Uh Uh-oh, Laura, you're on mute. Thank you. Thank you. Um, If you haven't checked out the virtual exhibition of Invisible Sun, it is up on our website. There are um, all of the different works, some information about Gabe and her process, and then there's a virtual tour, so you can actually kind of go through this gallery and see the pieces up close and back up and see the relationship to each other. So you can do that from your sofa or wherever you're on your computer. Um, and then we have a um, s- special wine pairing um, and tasting on. Tuesday, for those of you who are in Seattle, um, uh, local female restaurateur friend um, has um, opened a little side wine shop. And so they're going to be putting together a pairing of wines influenced by your work. And I wish you could be here so much. Um, we're going to slurp, 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 slurp. Too. It's going to be, yeah. <laughs> and we'll have. 
we'll have some of your paintings there and some of the works on paper that we have. And so um, we'll make sure and let you know all about that. Um, but please come if you're here in Seattle and interested. And, um, and then the next thing that we'll have featuring Gabe's work in real life will be um, participation in the Seattle Art Fair, which hopefully we'll have some of those big landscape, beautiful pieces there as well. Um, is there anything else you wanna talk about, Gabe? Um, no, I think we kind of covered it. Um, I think, I mean, you know, of course, if anybody has any questions, be sure, you know, you can ask me now, but if you think of something, you can always, you know, email Laura or you can email me. I'd be happy to chat with you. Um, I think, I think we covered it. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. I just appreciate your time and I appreciate everybody joining in and um, sharing your good energy and it's great to hang out. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.